All right. We have Into the Storm podcast number two, and we have a different mic here today. We have Jim, we have Tasia, and we have one Michael Meals. Mike was in a bunch of the old videos, all of our old YouTube videos, I'm sure, right? I spent two dudes in a row that are OG. OG mics. All the way back to the garage. <laughs> you guys were like neighbors though, weren't you? Me and Mike Plus, go way back actually yeah. to, was it my senior year of high school or yeah, junior? Senior 2005. Year. I was yeah. thinking about that the other day. Yeah. Junior high school, he was the assistant coach. He was the pitcher's coach though. Yeah. Yuck. Yeah. Gross. Just kidding. <laughs> He's a pretty decent <laughs> baseball player in your day, huh? Real decent. I would I would not use the word decent. I would say really good baseball player. Played a little bit of minor league ball too. So appreciate that. I missed the uh, the wood bat league. We're gonna oh, and, uh, we yeah, need to at least baseball. go play out, play some. I missed that. It's fun. The other thing, it's hard for me though because I'm so I'm used to seeing you in your principal. Principal. It, yeah. He was a middle school principal for how long? Uh, for ten years. Ten. Yeah, fifteen years in education. Feel like I've lived three lives. A baseball player. In education and now as a builder, so yeah, yeah I'm thankful. You look hard now, though. You look, you look rugged. <laughs> yeah, it's good. good. <laughs> All right, so this is Into the Storm podcast number two. Like we said last week, we're going to preface it with this is uh, it's completely about faith and our faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, this is a good Friday. We, you know, we're probably from here on out, it'll be one at a time, one one a week. But this week is a special week, very special week for um, us as Christians. And uh, we're going to give you a double dose this week. So this is a Good Friday episode. This isn't technically Good Friday for us. This is Wednesday. But we are going to talk about um, Jesus' suffering and, and the trial that he went, uh, part of the trial, I guess the second half of the trial. But um, let's go to, let's pray first and then we'll, uh, we'll get into it. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this incredible group uh, we have gathered here. Thank you for uh, just the sending your son to die for us and, and to purchase our souls on that cross. And uh, thank you for all that you do for us. I just pray that you'd watch over us, guide us, protect us, keep us safe. I just pray that your will be done in this podcast and that uh, whatever you want people to hear will be heard and whatever um, you feel like we should share, that we should share. In, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, so uh, basically the verses we're going to go over today um, – like I said, we're not gonna, we're not here to preach. We're not here to do anything, which is kind of our interpretation. There's not a ton of in- interpretation that goes into this, right. these verses. This is more of the story of of uh, what Jesus went through. And so usually what we do is we'll just read through the verse, and then we can all kind of talk about it. I think you listened. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mike is uh, a, a really good, uh, like Doc Phillips, who was here last week, uh, has a really good grasp on this type of stuff. And we're all kind of in a group together when, when I'll talk about this stuff, so. Glad to have you. Thank you. Um, I'll read through it the best I can. Uh, we may popcorn read here in a second, but uh, I'll read through it, and then we may talk about a little bit of when on before, um, but this was just kind of what was on my heart to, to read. So I have it broken up, and I had somebody comment about how I was reading the wrong interpretation, that I'm using the NLT instead of ASV <laughs> or, I got rich. or King James or... <laughs> I just, I'm not into thou's and thus and whilst. If you want that, go to Original Froning's Instagram because you'll get that there. <laughs> uh, but for me, New Living Translation is what I've been reading for the past probably year and a half. I started out with some ESV, but I like, NLT speaks to me a little bit better. So I'm sure if I could, I would read it in the Greek, but I, I can't read Greek. So I'm going to stick with this. So. Um, so it has it broken down into kind of stories. And so what it says, Jesus' trial before Pilate. Now Jesus was standing before Pilate, the Roman governor. Are you the king of the Jews? The governor asked him. Jesus replied, you have said it. But when the leading priests and elders made their accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. Don't you hear all these charges they're bringing against you, Pilate demanded. But Jesus made no response to any of the charges, much much to the governor's surprise. Now it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner to the crowd, anyone they wanted. This year, there was a notorious prisoner, a man named Barabbas. As the crowds gathered before Pilate's house that morning, he asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? He knew very well that the religious leaders had arrested Jesus out of envy. Just then, as Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him this message. Leave that innocent man alone. I suffered through a terrible nightmare about him last night. Meanwhile, the leading priests and elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be put to death. So the governor asked again, 
Which of these do you want me to release to you? The crowd shouted back, Barabbas. Pilate responded, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? They shouted back, Crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, Crucify him. Pilate saw, this, saw that he wasn't getting anywhere, and that, was, and that a riot was developing. So he sent for a bowl of water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. The responsibility is yours. And all the people yelled back, We will take responsibility for his death, we and our children. So Pilate re released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. The next part of the story says the soldiers mock him. The soldiers mock Jesus. Some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the headquarters and called out the entire regiment. They stripped him and put him in a scarlet robe, put a scarlet robe on him. They wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. They placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter. They knelt before him in mockery and taunted him. Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and grabbed the stick and struck him on the head with it. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off their robe and put, put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. The crucifixion. Along the way, they came across a man named Simon, who was from Cyrene. The soldiers forced him to carry, the, carry Jesus' cross. And they went out to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. The soldiers gave Jesus wine with bitter, mixed with bitter gall, but when he had tasted it, he refused to drink it. After they had nailed him to the cross, the soldiers grabbed his clothes by, or gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Then they sat around and kept guard as he hung there. A sign was fastened above Jesus' head, annou announcing the charge against him. It read, "This is Jesus, the King of the Jews." Two rev revolutionary yeah, revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. The people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. "Look at you now!" they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, if you are son of God, save yourself and come down from that cross. The leading priest, the teachers of the religious law, the elders also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. So he is <clears throat> the king of Israel, is he? Let him come down from the cross right now and we will believe in him. He trusted God, so let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the revolutionaries who were crucified with him ridiculed him in the same way. Uh, the death of Jesus. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Ela, Ela, Lama, Sabachthani, I guess is the best way I'm going to say it. So, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me or forsaken me, whichever translation you want to say. Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling out to the prophet Eli, Elijah. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding, up to, holding it up to him on a reed stick so he could drink. But the rest said, uh, wait, let's see if Elijah comes to save him. Then Jesus shouted out again and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. The Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and what had happened. They said, this man truly was the Son of God. And many women who had come from Galilee with Jesus to care for him were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the burial of Jesus. As evening approached, Jesus, a rich man for uh, Jesus, Joseph, a rich man for um, Arimathea, Arimathea, who had become a follower of Jesus, went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. And Pilate issued an order to, re to release him. Uh, Jesus or Joseph, man, I keep saying Jesus. Uh, Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a long sheet of clean linen cloth. He placed it in his own new tomb which had been carved out of rock. Then he rolled a great stone across the entrance and left. Both Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting across from the tomb and watching. Last, last section. The guard at the tomb. The next day on the Sabbath, the leading priests and Pharisees went to see Pilate. They told him, Sir, we remember that the deceiver once said that while he was still alive, three, after three days I will rise from the dead. 
So we request that you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing his body and then telling everyone he was raised from the dead. If that happens, we'll be worse off than we were at first. Pilate replied, take guards and secure it the best you can. So they sealed the tomb and posted guards to protect it. All right, so that's a long, probably longer than we'll ever go on this. Um, but I feel like today is probably the best day to go about doing that and telling the whole story. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, there's a lot to kind of unpack there. And we kind of really started, I guess, in the middle of the story because that was already really long. Um, Jesus had, did he start out at Pilate and then went to Herod and then came back to Pilate? I think that's how it all goes, right? Like he's... Yeah, I think Pilate sent him away to... Yeah, to Herod because Herod was kind of like a co-leader of the territory. So Jerusalem is under Roman law, under Roman, you know, jurisdiction at this time uh, in history. Um, and so, you know, these Jewish priests uh, brought these charges up against Jesus. And this is the night before, I guess, when all this kind of started happening, Jesus has already been beat up a little bit to this point. You know, they've, they've done some things and then they bring him to Pilate. Pilate doesn't want to be the one to, <laughs> to pass judgment. He kind of twice, he basically pa- tries to pawn it off on somebody else. Well, sends him to Herod. Uh, Jesus basically um, gets, you know, told or asked the same things by Herod doesn't answer him. So Herod sends him back to Judas. And so that's where we kind of, kind of took in. And, and uh, that's where we're at in Matthew 11, 27 verses 11. So um, I guess we can just start. What would you guys see here? Maybe in this first little section, the first, the second uh, part of what was going on with Pilate. We think, (laughs) well, you know, um, I have a hard time reading through uh, this story of Jesus and not think about what's in Isaiah 53. Yeah. And when I read like in verse 12 and then again in verse 14, it talks about how Jesus remained silent. I mean, this is the son of God. I mean, if anybody could call down and get rescued, it would be him. But he knew what was before him. Um and so I wanted to maybe share a couple of verses out yeah, of Isaiah before. 53. I think it's super important to, you know, who Jesus is mm-hmm. to tell definitely what happens in Isaiah 53. Yeah. So this is a prophecy in Isaiah 53 about what Jesus did for us. Um, I'll just start in verse four. Uh, Well, I'll start in verse three. It says, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. And then in verse 7, it kind of touches on uh, what we read in in verse 12 of Matthew 27. He was oppressed and treated harshly, harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. He was struck down for the rebellion of many people. He had done no wrong. He had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave, which goes back to uh, with Joseph giving his, his grave to Jesus. Um, it's just a great prophecy. You know, I think about um, just the, the weight. You know, even I was thinking about this this morning. And I, and I wondered from, from a lot of different angles. Number one, you know, Jesus knew what he had to do. Mm-hmm. And the importance of that. 
And and I almost think like the devil thought that he had the upper hand. Like yeah. he knew, he, he thought he knew that he was going to have victory in this. But I've wondered, you know, if, if the devil really understood, would he have allowed this to happen? Because what it meant for us is that heaven's doors are open wide right. for us through what Jesus did. And just a, a lot of different things in here. Um, you know, something that, that my family, we started doing, um, you know, I, I don't want to say it was just because of the, the pandemic that we're in, but just in remembrance of what Jesus did for us, we've started doing communion as a family, you know, just at our house. And, you know, in verse 27 in, in, in Matthew, talking about what Jesus' body, what, what he took upon himself. Um, and when we take communion, remember what Jesus took upon his body, that his body was broken, it was pierced, it was beaten for our salvation, for our healing, um, for our victory, mm-hmm. and then what the, what the blood also represents. And I think that, there, that this is such a, um, this is something that we need to remember as Christians. We can't take lightly. Mm-hmm. It's good to remember on, on a regular basis. And I believe that when, when you come to the Lord's table and you, and you take communion, you know, as a family, you know, we, we pray those promises over us, the protection, the healing, uh, his providence, um, and then we, we pray, you know, the power of the blood of Jesus over our lives for the forgiveness of sin. Um, it's this whole, this whole, like Tejas, you, you said, it was, there's so much in this chapter yeah. um, that is so powerful. Um, to piggyback on what you're saying, I think it's impossible really to, to talk about 27 without talking about 26, mm-hmm. chapter 26, because it sets the whole scene. Yeah. Um, Jesus goes through that whole process of well, the all. Jews had had celebrated Passover and the Seder for 3,500 years, and so the the bombshell that's being dropped here and why Jesus is in so much trouble is because he's it. he's telling everybody, hey, this bread right here that you've been you've been eating in remembrance of what happened and how the Israelites came out of Egypt, that's now me. And my body is going to be broken for you. That's what this bread should represent. And in this Seder, they would, they would eat a bitter root. And that bitter root was designed to remind them of the pain and the trouble and the hardship that they were in in Egypt and how God brought them out. And now, hey, I'm, I'm that guy now. I'm going to take that. And for, for the 12 disciples, they're freaking out because they've yeah. heard this for their whole entire life. And Jesus is now saying to them, hey, I, I want you to look to me for that now. Unbelievable. And this blood, this blood is now my blood. What I'm getting ready to do here in 27 is me. Yeah. Not, you're not just. You're not sacrificing a lamb anymore. Right. I'm, I'm the sacrificial lamb. So the significance, I mean, he, it was kind of funny because in 26, if you remember the story, it was all kind of top secret. Mm-hmm. The upper room thing was all kind of top secret. Everybody kind of, because. Jesus knew what was getting ready to happen. He knew the setup and he wanted to make sure he had the opportunity to talk to the disciples. So they had this in their heart and their mind moving forward, which was really powerful. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge change from what tradition had been moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. So I think like I put myself in that position, right. Of like the disciples. mm -hmm. And I think about if Jesus was saying these things to me, like, would I understand that at all or believe this that is my or blood. think right what you are you talking what I mean? about bro i'm not drinking your blood man because i like, think uh, that would be like yeah yeah i would be super mixed up right mm-hmm. and I mean, like it's easy for you now to say yeah yeah i'd right. believe that but in that moment like would you really like you've mm-hmm. seen these miracles this guy had done you'd seen all these things because the disciples now apostles after this will be were guys that had been with him everywhere and anywhere and seen these miracles but still you're like wait a minute, you're mm-hmm. saying, you know, you're the son of God. Because there's a couple times in different verses where they, you know, Jesus says that and they're kind of like, yeah, yeah, I'm sure they're just like, yeah, yeah, sure, man, whatever, mm-hmm. you're, whatever you say. And so when it really comes to a head, like, I mean, it's funny, you know, you always talk about, you know, in your darkest moment or in, yeah, in the darkest moment. Yeah, greatest you know, moment of opportunity, greatest, greatest darkest, moment opportunity, dark, darkest hour, would you be enough? Peter three times yeah. is like, no, I don't know who that is. No, that's not my guy, you know? Part like, of that deal in the dinner was he told them, hey, one of you is going to betray me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the rest of you, well, they actually betrayed him too because yeah. they all ran off yeah. when it got tough. And so they're being hit in that meal 
with a bunch of revelation. Tradition is, be, and, that, and that's why the Pharisees are mad at him and the chief priests are mad at him because he's really put himself in a position. People thought he was actually going to be the king. Right. The real king. Real king, yeah. So there's a ton of turmoil well, around he is what the he's real doing. King. He's just not the earthly king right. they were expecting. Right? They were thinking he was going to overthrow Rome. Right. Yeah, and, and save save Jerusalem. And so, that, isn't that what Jesus does the best, though? He just wrecks perceptions. Yeah. I mean, he just, in each of us, you know, and, and just breaks you down to where. It's, a, it's amazing to me that he knew it. He designed it mm-hmm. at Passover, that he, he put himself in the space of all that. And then he knew this was all happening in the middle of all that. Yep. That's, that's crazy coincidence, you know, to me. That just kind of blows my mind. Yeah. Um... I'm just going to go through this a little bit. Uh, so, uh, the Barabbas thing, this was something I read in the, the thing, in the commentary, this enduring word commentary. So, the parallel between us and Barabbas, mm. that Jesus took his place where he takes our place as well. And I never really thought about this. So, like, think about if you're Barabbas in a cell <laughs> and you're hearing all this go on, but you're probably only hearing the crowd cheering and crowd yelling, and I this until I read this uh, commentary. I didn't think about it. So you know, you're hearing Pilate say, you know, who would you want me to release? And they say Barabbas. So all he hears is his name Barabbas, and he's like, oh great. And then they're like, well, what do you want me to do with Jesus? And all they hear, all he hears is crucify him. So your Barabbas is thinking, all right, well, here we go. <laughs> and then he comes in, opens the gate, and they're like, hey man, you're free. Like, can you imagine where your headspace is at that point? And he should be the one that's, you know, they don't really ever talk about him again. Um, I think in Mark, you know, there's different accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the story is just a touch different, nothing major different, but um, they may go into a little bit more uh, detail in certain areas. But just to think about that from Barabbas, I mean, we're Barabbas, mm. really, you know, we're the, we're the ones that should have been on that cross and he's, he, Jesus took our place. And same with Barabbas is kind of crazy. I never thought about it that way uh, to hear, think about, put myself in Barabbas's uh, mindset or, or, or spot. So it's kind of cool. That'd have been crazy because that's, you're going to die, mm-hmm. you know, and you deserve to die. Mm-hmm. And I think Pilate knew it too. I think Pilate was thinking, you know, this is the way I can get out of this mm-hmm. is I can, you know, I'll, they're all going to want Jesus because he's really not done anything. Yeah. Right. And then he gets yeah. stuck. You know, and Pilate's like, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'll be out of this whole deal. And Pilate's like one of the most influ <laughs> or like most looked at person in you know, like the whole mm. uh, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Like it's his name is forever etched in this whole story where he was like, you know, I'm going to wash my hands with this and I'll never <laughs> be remembered again for this. And to think of like he's such a crucial role in this because he's the one that I mean, he could have saved we know he didn't you know it wasn't part of the story but he could have saved jesus's life you know he could have had a backbone and stood up and yeah. been like hey you guys are wrong this this man is completely innocent but he he's a coward what yeah. a, like a, a wishy-washy person yeah. who could have yeah. done what yep. was right and he knew what was right mm-hmm. but he didn't sure i think uh pilot washing his hands is like super significant and it, it makes me think of i was listening to a sermon and they brought up before this, we didn't read it in this passage, but when Jesus is washing his disciples' feet and just the difference in leadership, right? So like hmm. Jesus is on the floor washing his disciples' feet and like serving these people. And then Pilate, like to juxtapose, he's washing his hand to like sit back and be a leader of like, ah, I don't really want to make this decision. I don't want it to be on me. Mm-hmm. And just like the difference in, really I good. feel like like the significance of that is really cool that that's part of the story that Matthew documented that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. How many times have we said that in our culture and you don't even have to be a faith person. Hey man, look, I'm washing my hands. I'm washing my right? hands yeah. of this. Yeah. yeah. That's not what I'm going to, that's yeah. directly that's from the from, story. Yeah. And then now he's remembering, you know, like yeah. trying to be a footnote in the story. He becomes one of the main characters in the story. Yeah. Um, you know, the crowd, you want to talk about just, you know, how pandemonium just takes over. And, you know, yeah. probably these people had seen Jesus and seen the good things that he'd done, but, you know, he gets so worked up and he just, it's just crazy. Yeah. The crowd, the crowd part too, I wrote down, I wrote crowd equals less guilt per person. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Spread it out. And so take. it's like, mm. you know, strength in numbers of maybe you don't believe it, but everyone else is doing it. So you're just going to hop on board and. That's pretty significant. The irony too of yeah. his blood be on us and on our children. 
you know, that's, he covers us with his blood, mm -hmm. yeah. but they were and it. Also, you know, people want to say that, uh, part of that, the, the fall of Jerusalem, what, 40 years later or something like that, you could, you could look at part of that. Uh, but I think of it more as the saving grace of Jesus's blood, which is kind of, kind of cool that mm -hmm. they, they were thinking it was the other way, but you know, it depends on if, if they accepted it or not after this. Um, so the suffering, this, the suffering of Jesus is just like, it's almost unfathomable just how like Romans, this method of, of killing somebody, making them suffer is like, they, they wouldn't even do it to most of their citizens. You know, it says like slaves because they, they would only usually do it to slaves and really bad criminals because it was almost looked upon as you're less than human to be crucified. It's insane. Just what, uh, there was a doctor, um, I'll read through kind of what, what's the guy's name? Dr. William Edwards. This is from an article on the physical death of Jesus Christ from the Journal of American Medicine. The goal of the scourging was to weaken the victim to a state just short of collapse and death. As the Roman soldiers repeatedly struck the victims back with full force, the iron balls would cause deep contusions and the leather thongs and sheep bones would cut into the skin and subcutaneous t tissue. Then as flogging continued, the lacerations would tear into underlying skeletal muscles and produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. Pain and blood loss generally set the stage for circulatory shock and my iPad just died. But basically, <laughs> uh, what I read last night is, so you would just create all this just chaos in the back of this person and like rip their muscles, their skin, their blood, everything, make it so uncomfortable on the back, uh, lose blood. And then as they would nail them to the cross, they would hit a nerve. And so basically like you're hit, getting hit in the funny bone constantly on both arms. Um, they would nail it through your feet. And so they would put you on this cross and you couldn't pull up because it would, you know, hit these funny, the, the nerve, you couldn't push up on your feet because it was a similar, you know, feeling in your legs. And so basically you would just suffocate, mm -hmm. you know, you would, you couldn't push against the back, like just the, this is literally the most miserable way to die. Mm -hmm. Yes. And is absolutely gruesome. You know, that it almost reminds me of Case for Christ. Yeah. That Case passage. Case for Christ is great. You know, if you've never read Case for Christ, they interview a forensic. It might even be that yeah, same it might be article. That, that same article. Because I remember qu quivering ribbons of flesh. Yeah. I remember that from the book. Yeah. And, you know, he talks about that the word excruciating, it was a word that was. Crucifixion. That means out of the cross. Yeah. The pain is so unbearable that there was no word to describe it, that the word excruciating was invented, for lack of a better word, meaning out of the cross. Yep. And I mean, I've never fact-checked that, but you know, every time I've ever used the word excruciating, it's Comes like that, that, that is prompted in me, you know, that I have no idea what, what kind of pain that is. Um, the, things, so, the things that he said, that Jesus said when he was on the cross, five or six things that he said, I think are really significant. When he... When he cries out to God, you know, he, he where are you? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. why have you abandoned me? Mm -hmm. And the response that he got back from God was nothing. Right. And th that moment is significant for my life. I, I know that for me, and I'm just talking about me now, yeah. Jim Hensel, there are a lot of times that the things that I've been through where I cried out for God and the response that I got was nothing. And, and I was frustrated and I was angry, even mad at God. Um, and, and then faced with the choice to come forward and to have faith and to not quit and, and to believe, you know, mm -hmm. um, knowing that there had to be something that was worthwhile on the other side of it. And you look at Christ's example on the cross where he gets nothing from God mm -hmm. because it's his time to die. Mm -hmm. And that's why he was there and he knew it. Yeah. And he was there to suffer and he was forsaken in that moment for yeah. sure. Separated. Yeah. He had to be. Um, and we'll talk later about the cool things that happen on the other side. Right. But, but I, I remember that as an example, who Jesus was there. And then I'm reminded in my life. And I think for all of us that 
I mean, Christ said that there was hardship and there was pain and there was suffering for all of us. And that's right. just a part of what we're going to do in life. Right. But, but what's cool is that the journey ends in strength. When there's faith, yep. it ends in strength. Yep. It, ends, it ends in eternal life or even life here on the planet. And, and so for me, I'm always encouraged when I think about the hard things I've gone through or will go through that Jesus was that example. Mm-hmm. And that, and that he, he actually walked it out. He lived it out. He cried out. He didn't get anything back. And he went ahead and put his head down literally and did what he had to do. Right. Um, and that's challenging for me. That's significant for me in that space. Yeah. And, I, and I've wondered too, you know, that pain that we've read about the, the torture. I bet you that that doesn't even compare to that feeling of abandonment that Jesus felt. It's the first moment. time he's been separated from God. It's the first, I wrote the exact same really? thing there, Rich. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's exactly right. And it's just, it's crazy, you know, like, I, you know, I don't want, I don't know it enough to like get into the, you know, I'm sure people are going to can tear apart anything that scholarly that we talk about, but it's, that's the point where it's like, where he, he laid down all the, you know, they say all the sins of all the past, the present, the future, all those sins were on him at that moment. Mm -hmm. And from then on, you know, that's, we don't, we don't have those traditions anymore. Those things, we don't have to sacrifice the lamb We're you know, the, the, um, the veil between the holiest of holies is open. And I feel like that's now we're allowed to go to God yep. through Jesus. Absolutely. You know, we don't have to back in before this, you had to, you know, you had an intermediary, basically a Levite. I think it was Levite, the tribe of Levi were the priests mm-hmm. where you would have to basically go and sacrifice something or give them something to sacrifice. And your only way to talk to God was through somebody else. And now we have a direct line to God. We're, we're, adopted children of God through Jesus. Amen. And so that's that moment. That's that abandonment that he felt was what had to happen for us to, to have that. That's the one thing I think in my, in my faith, you know, I look at it in a relationship kind of a way. And if it's not for that, it's not even possible because we're, yeah, I can't imagine before, you know, like if, (laughs) What was going on? Like, would you have today? Can you imagine if you had to go? I don't know. Grab one of the bison out of the field, and all right, I right. I did this. My kids did this. Blah blah blah. Here's this. Give it to the priest. And it happened once a year. Yeah. 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 Once a year. Yeah. And it's just it's crazy. I, mean, uh, I ask for forgiveness every day. Every day. Yeah. 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 Like Multiple all day. times yeah. a day. <laughs> yeah. And for and to feel free to be able to talk to God every day. Amen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. a big deal for me. Mm-hmm. And then even to get over the, some of the religious approach, yeah. just the to be rules. able to say, hey, God, yeah. it's me. Yeah. Here's where I'm at. This is what's going on in my world. See, oh, um, what's, uh, hear my heart. What is it? Uh, is it Casting Crowns? Here's my heart, Lord. Mm-hmm. It, that song's amazing, but that's it. It's mm-hmm. just like you have that, like you have that connection now. You have that relationship where before it wasn't there. And so all those things that Jesus did to lead up to that point, the suffering, the, you know, all that he did on that cross, and then that separation from God was, you know, the pain that he went through. So we didn't have to have that pain. And yeah. it's uh, yeah. pretty incredible. Super significant right now where we're at yeah. in the culture. Doesn't matter till it matters. Yeah. A lot of people talking about faith and values right now. It's when things are good, what do you need Jesus for? It's easy. Yeah. It's easy. We, we, we get in the momentum and the patterns of life that make us successful and we're fine. And then something like where we're at right now comes along and we're really remembering. And I'm just reminded, man, good times, bad times all the time. Yeah. It's significant. And, and really most of the, I mean, what we went through is nothing compared to what he went through right. on that cross. Think about that. Like, yeah, even if you're in significant pain from something, I still feel like that's, probably one it's the most painful way to die it's the most shameful way to die mm-hmm. think about everybody mocking you like it talks about the roman soldiers in there like spitting on him yeah. you know inflicting more pain on to on him you know like not only are you physically being assaulted you're mentally being assaulted you're emotionally being assaulted like there's all kinds of things going on and so um it's just kind of and that he's silent through the whole yeah, thing silent through the whole like, thing just took it you know like a like it says like a lamb going to slaughter yeah um, 
and not only that, but I, I was thinking too, you know, I always wondered what in the world is this bitter gall? You know, the, yeah. the soldiers mm-hmm. tried to give him wine mixed with bitter gall. And in my notes in here, it says that they would put a sedative. In to it. numb it. Yeah. To numb the pain. But, but Jesus refused it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that just goes to show that, you know, Jesus was fully human. Yeah. He had all the feelings, all the emotions. Yes, he was God, mm-hmm. but he was fully human. And so he willingly understood what was before him. Clear mind and took it upon himself. Didn't want any uh, drugs, sedation, nothing, and willingly took all that upon his body. It is it is absolutely unbelievable. It's kind of crazy to me. Like the Romans do all this, and then they're like, "Hey, here's a sedative," and like to ease the pain. It's kind of like, what do you like? Wouldn't right. you wouldn't you want him to feel the whole thing? I don't mm-hmm. know. It's just weird, but yeah, it's crazy that. The last thing that he says, forgive them. Mm -hmm. They don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Like, think about if what's the last thing you're gonna say when you especially if somebody was like torturing you, would you say forgive them? Yeah. What would you say? Like, it's his legacy almost. Like that, the last thing that came out of his mouth was, "Man, I don't know what they're doing. Forgive them." Like, I don't know if that's me or not. Honestly, I'm. Um, My prayer might be strike him down with a thunderbolt or lightning or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> give, him, give it back to him. Do the same Bastard. thing to them. Yeah. Well, I can't say well, that. Well, he, he knows yeah, that he does get to say that in the end. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, but. Well, we know on the other side, but yeah. you were talking yeah. about him yeah. being fully human. Yeah. 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 Like yeah. the worst hurt, the worst pain for me is being treated poorly by somebody that you really love and you're really honestly trying to do what's right by him. That's yeah. the worst hurt, yeah. let alone being killed for it. Your father. Think right. about that. Or yeah. even think about what God at that moment, like, can you imagine? Yeah. I can't imagine. Do you like seeing my son on that? No. Hey, any of my kids on that? Like, I can't imagine that. Mm-hmm. The pain of that. Um, you know, some other cool things that I was reading in commentary. Uh, there was actually a historian, a Roman historian that said that there was a, because it, there was a, an eclipse and an earthquake on the same day on a certain year. I can't, it was a 202nd Olympiad or something like that. Um, all, so it around the time that this would have happened. Hmm. And it also said that it was a, since it was during Passover, I, I, I don't have my notes, um, but it said it was a full moon. So an actual solar wasn't eclipse possible. wasn't possible. Yeah. So it would, had to be an act of God. And so it's it's just kind of crazy those things do line up, you know. Like there's and people yeah. can argue and you know I'm sure there's going to be naysayers and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but it's either you believe or you don't. That's, that's kinda, really cool because I literally wrote in my notes I put darkness, but how impossible because of the full moon yeah. there couldn't be a natural couldn't be eclipse. A, couldn't be an eclipse. Um, I got I got multiple emails after we did the first one. Yeah, uh, and it's mildly frustrating for me when people. Well, you know me really well. Yeah. So when people get too far off into theology or get yeah. upset about something, yeah. that really bothers me. Um, and, and and the trouble is it it keeps us from talking about this and learning from each other yeah. and, and trying and trying to figure out how we really want to connect to it. And it's really important. It's yeah. really important yeah. for us to get together and have this conversation and then not be jammed up about well, what we I don't, don't know. know. Yeah. Or, I'm not, like, I've not been to... Yeah. To, Theology school? I don't yeah. Know what the like term. seminary? Yeah. I'm, seminary. Learning, there we go. I'm seminary. learning so much in and, these, for real. And it's so, really it's, but it's like, it's on us, you know, if we're going to talk about it, you want to research it a little bit. So, it's actually made me do a little bit more research other than just checking the box of, hey, I read my Bible today. Yeah. And so, like I said, there's going to, we're definitely going to have, and there's, I'm, I'm all for positive discussion on stuff, mm-hmm. but don't come in and be like, hey, you, you're using the wrong translation. I'm like, come on. Yeah, let's not do that. Come on, man. Let's uh, encourage. Um, What else was there after that? So, we got death um and there's different accounts so i encourage actually to go look at uh mark luke and john's accounts of the same story um i think a couple of them or one or two of them say that one of the criminals that were being crucified with jesus actually um believed in him when it happened yep Um, this is really cool because like like how much faith does it take just a little bit yeah just a little bit yeah but it doesn't require a whole lot from us. Yeah, because Jesus was looks done. at him and says, I'll see you in paradise. Mm-hmm. Well, think about that dude sitting next to him. He doesn't know who Jesus is. He doesn't understand the significance. He's watching it happen as he's dying. And he literally at the end just goes, uh, he just checks in right yeah. there at the end. Hey, yeah. man, like, could I be with you? 
Just a tiny little bit of faith. Yeah. Couldn't have been a whole lot. Yeah. Because the dude was a common criminal. Faith of a mustard seed. Yeah. And that's pretty amazing, actually. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And then a Roman soldier, one of the, a couple of the soldiers were like, uh, this, it's kind of cool that they say this was the son of God, but mm. they actually should say this is the son of God. Mm. It's, it doesn't really go away. Um, mm. So that was another thing. I'm trying to think of what else. Well, so then they. I, I liked in verse 50, um, you know, how much Jesus, this stuff wasn't happening to Jesus. Jesus laid down his life. Right. Mm -hmm. He was in complete control from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. We know that Jesus was with God at the beginning of creation. Mm -hmm. He knew what was before him and what he was going to have to do. And in verse 50, Jesus shouted out again and, and release, and he released, released his spirit. Um, and that just, he, he wanted to do this for us. Mm -hmm. He wanted us to be in a relationship with his father. And it just, I think it's incredible. Um, and I loved, I love, you know, where the temple uh, curtain was torn from top to bottom. Yeah. That's just awesome. That's, that's, that's so important to me. And I'm glad you brought that up. Like he, I think sometimes people look at it as, as it was put on him. And that's not true. He walked right at it. He's, mm -hmm. I'm always talking about from a position of strength. Mm -hmm. He literally walked right into this of his own accord and through strength made this happen. It wasn't like he got chased down and, right. no. and you know, no. he did all that. He Are you following to, me? He, yeah. Yeah. There on purpose. he willingly gave yeah. himself up. He played offense. Yeah. He made that happen. And that's another powerful example. If I'm us. allowed, can I read an okay. excerpt from? Okay. Yeah. So I, I didn't know when I would, sh would share this, but this is from a book uh, called He Chose the Nails by Max Licato, a uh, great author. He's written a bazillion books. Read all of them. Uh, but to Jim's point, um, he talks about, you know, what Jesus did, uh, and he references in this little short thing here, he talks about the list, and that's just the, the list of our sins, but uh, and this is what it says. It says, this is why he refused Jesus to close his fist. He saw the list. What kept him from resisting? This warrant, this tabulation of your failures, he knew the price of those sins was death. He knew the source of those sins was you. And since he couldn't bear the thought of eternity without you, he chose the nails. The hand squeezing the handle was not a Roman infantryman. The force behind the hammer was not an angry mob. The verdict behind the death was not decided by jealous Jews. Jesus himself chose the nails. So the hands of Jesus opened up. Had the soldier hesitated, Jesus himself would have swung the mallet. He knew how. He was no stranger to driving nails. As a carpenter, he knew what it took. And as a savior, he knew what it meant. He knew that the purpose of the nail was to place your sins where they could be hidden by his sacrifice and covered by his blood. So Jesus himself swung the hammer. The same hand that stilled the seas stills your guilt. The same hand that cleansed the temple cleanses your heart. The hand is the hand of God. The nail is the nail of God. And as the hands of Jesus open for the nail, the doors of heaven open for you. And That's cool. Yeah, I don't think anything that I've read it helps explain that. You know, if, if they would have all stopped, Jesus would have still gone still through would have it happened, yeah. because of, of what the weight of this meant for all of us to be able to spend eternity with his Father. It's crazy. He said it's finished. Mm hmm so it is. The work's been done. Done. So there's nothing else we have to do. And, and I know for me in my life, I struggle with that sometimes. And I know a lot of people who do. Like, I got to get it right. Mm -hmm. I got to get it cleaned up before. Mm -hmm. uh, That's what we talked about last week is the simplicity of Christ. Like, it's, it's simple. That you have to, all, you, all you really have to do is believe that he is. Mm -hmm. That's all you have to do. But we want to make it this super complicated thing. It you know falls back in tradition and, mm -hmm. and law and religion. Mm -hmm. That's what I think of as religion is yeah. law, and it's just the simplicity of that. And so it's kind of cool. You were talking about was Isaiah fifty three, and like the prophecy and all that type of stuff. Um, this is something that stuck out at this is post to him dying on the cross, and you know some of the prophecy in fifty three. You're like, oh, Jesus could have made that happen. Like he could have, you know. He knows he knows the law because he studied it and was a rabbi and 
And so he could have made some of these things happen. This next one, though, so he's crucified, right? So usually what happens is they leave him on the cross, let animals, let vultures just basically let the bodies decompose on the cross. This was right before Passover, so the Jews want the bodies taken down because they don't want to see because it's up on this hill, it's on this high road. Well, so they take. So usually, if this was so in in Isaiah fifty three, it says he was laid in a rich man's tomb. Mm-hmm. This wouldn't have happened, and Jesus couldn't have made this happen. This happened because it was a, a prophecy, and so I thought that was a kind of a mm-hmm. cool yep. um, thing. And so Joseph takes the tomb that he bought and puts Jesus in the tomb. And then it also talks about um, the fact that, you know, because everybody wants, there's all these different theories that, you know, <laughs> Jesus was still alive. There was, you know, uh, <laughs> what one of the things that I read in here was like, this guy got a, a letter from, or an email asking, saying his pastor was saying, is it, what do they call it? The swoon theory? Swooning theory, theory Swooning yeah. theory, yep. that Jesus was still alive. And, you know, his pastor was saying that this could happen and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, all right, here's my answer. Have your pastor be flogged, have him have nails put through his wrists, through his ankles, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, a, uh, spear. a spear jammed through his heart and see if he's still alive. <laughs> like, that you, know was what, the- you know what I think is the greater testimony to all that is that what kind of following would Jesus have if he swooned? Yeah. And then reappeared to those twelve. Right. Do you think that they would want to leave? Why would that you die for? Yeah. And go like, uh, do I need to? Oh, I want to follow this guy. Right. I mean, look at him. He looks. He has had the tarnations beat out. Because all him. of them, all of them, gave up their life for Christ after this. So if Jesus wasn't who he said he was, if he didn't die and come back, or if he did die and come, like, why would you die for a guy that's? telling a lie well i'm not gonna go and they all did all Mm -hmm. of them died Mm -hmm. all of them except for uh was it who was it that just got i guess it was paul right paul Paul, paul was uh he wasn't crucified like some of them were crucified and all these other things paul was was, crucified upside down timothy was filleted alive i think they say yeah uh Anyway, John all of them were killed oil. in horrible ways. Horrible, yeah. Not like, <laughs> right. like you wouldn't do that for a guy that's full of crap. Yeah. Like I wouldn't, you know. So and what it talks about too is <laughs> that, um, you know, the the guards that were guarding the tomb weren't just some guys. Like they were Roman soldiers. They don't care what happens to the Jewish law or what, you know, what happens to the Jews. All they know is they're supposed to protect this tomb and it was sealed They actually take a rope and then something and seal the Mm -hmm. tomb. And so if they don't protect this tomb, they're dead. And so they would give their life for it, you know? So, I mean, you either believe or you don't. That's basically what it comes down to, I believe. And 2,000 years later, we're still following him and reading about him. To your point, communion. You know, that's what it kind of... That's the whole story. It it boils down to communion now and it's something that we can do to remember it and we should do to remember Mm -hmm. it agreed yeah anything else we covered that whole it's exciting to talk about the resurrection that'll be that'll be a great topic we're doing that next yeah we're gonna have to get a fifth uh fifth headset so we can have you and doc in here so (laughs) jeez these guys get, they get excited. Did get you excited. see the text thread? Oh, I did. We're trying to work <laughs> out. It's just blowing up. You guys were so into it. I awful because I, I looked up and I was like, no, we're doing it Friday. And then I was like, oh, man, I hope he's prepared. It's, yeah, oh, yeah. He's fine. Yeah, man. Oh, yeah. Just, he, just, he fine. just fine. Just fine. It's, it's an honor to be here. I, I love talking about the well, word. We'll keep and, doing it if you keep doing it. So that, I mean, right now, these are kind of special-ish episodes. Um, like I said, we're doing Good Friday. This will be for Friday. And then we'll do a Sunday resurrection one. But from then on, we're just going to kind of find some verses and interpret and see how we can apply it can you hear my stomach growling no. from intermittent fasting i'm really afraid <laughs> no, what it. time is it mine i've been going noon to noon to eight 11 30 close Woo, so. right there <laughs> awesome got anything else we want to I, w- I would just say that you know and we know that the word of god is powerful it's uh god has it go forth to accomplish a purpose and if anybody's listening to this and you know, I would encourage them, you know, to reach out to somebody in their life that they know has a good grasp of the word. Yeah. And because, you know, I believe that, that lives are changed when people read the word, they hear about it, 
you know, and it's, this is a life and death decision and people, you know, if, if, if you don't believe that you're in the right place, talk to somebody who knows this, ask Jesus in your heart. And I mean, today is the day. Mm -hmm. Don't wait. Like Jim said, you don't have to wait to get cleaned up. Nope. Um, you know, Jesus said he didn't come for the healthy, you know, he's come for those that need him. Right. And, and essentially we all need him. It's a matter of us realizing that and being drawn by the Holy Spirit. I don't, I, I really agree with that. I don't, I don't really know anybody that's, that's uber successful <laughs> and that lives in all of who they were designed to be that doesn't have an opinion about this one way or the yeah. other. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm always challenging people. Figure it out and decide, F figure out what that spiritual piece of who you are really means. That's important. It's, you know? a, it's a parallel and I hate using the CrossFit analogy or parallel, but we have a ton of CrossFitters I'm sure that are listening. It's everybody wants to say, well, I got to get fit before I do CrossFit. Mm -hmm. I hate that. It's the same with this. It's like, I got to get my life right before I go to Jesus. No, that's why you need Jesus. I don't have my life right. Like I'm still, like it's something we're working on every, every day. day. <laughs> it's, a, it's a battle every day. Amen. It, so. This is a crazy analogy of what you just said though. But the first time way back in the day that you asked me to come work out with you mm -hmm. and the team, I, I drove into this parking lot and <laughs> left three times. <laughs> I do it every day too. I don't, I, from, from a <laughs> fitness perspective, I don't deserve, and it was just you guys at right. that point. It was just the team. Yeah. And, and I was like, man, I don't deserve to be in that space. I should not be in there working out with them. And that's really how I felt. Right, right. And, and you told me, hey, listen, I wouldn't have asked you to come if I didn't want you to be here. Right. But it's the same analogy. Right. With don't, don't be the, fit before you show well, up. That's how you, that's that's how how you, you get fit. fit you is know? to don't, show up. You don't, it's, it's finished. It's done. The work's done. He, Did nothing it. else you need to do. Right. We, can, we, can, we can go to the presence of God and we can talk to him personally and it can make a difference and it leads to life. The veil was torn. Awesome. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'll close in prayer and we'll, we'll be good to go. Lord, thank you once again for this incredible group. Thank you for this discussion and uh, the words that came out of everybody's mouth. I hope that it, it um, opens some hearts to you, Jesus. And I just thank you so much for what you endured on that cross and, and uh, just what you've done for us and purchasing our souls. And I just pray that we would glorify you in all that we do and that we would make your known, main name known to as many people as we can. And, uh, Jesus, we love you. God, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.